It became clear as the year 2000 wore on that WCW was very likely beyond saving. Bleeding millions of dollars and irreparably harmed by countless bad decisions both in the ring and behind the scenes, the promotion hardly resembled the sports entertainment powerhouse it had been just a couple of years prior. Rather than the place where the big boys play, which had, lest we forget, beaten WWE for 83 straight weeks in the ratings on Monday nights, WCW was at this point simply trying to live another day. And their days were numbered. With so much instability, it's unsurprising that the group's pay-per-view output was far from stellar. In fact, plainly speaking, it was downright awful. But just how bad did it get, and is there anything redeeming within the dross? I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is every WCW pay-per-view of 2000 ranked from worst to best. Join us. Number 12, The Great American Bash. When a match involving David Flair is the best thing on a show, you know you're in serious, serious trouble. And serious trouble is exactly what WCW was in come the summer of 2000, as the company continued to circle the drain on the way to their inevitable demise. It didn't have to be this way, but so it was, and the promotion didn't even have the decency to give fans some half-decent wrestling on one of their signature events while it chucked money down the drain and battled with ever-present backstage turmoil. Kicking this disaster off were the usually dependable cruiserweights. Well, one of them anyway, Chavo Guerrero, wrestling here in his Misfits in Action Lieutenant Loco guys was dependable. The other one was Disco Inferno. The bout lasted a shade under five minutes and was basically a backdrop for the war between MIA and the Filthy Animals. It's worth noting that at one point, an old man in army clothes came to ringside and had a heart attack. He was then revived after the match by Major Guns, who kindly took her kit off before giving him mouth to mouth. Chronic's victory over the Mama Luke started out okay-ish enough, but quickly disintegrated into a sloppy mess. Mike Awesome and Diamond Dallas Page's ambulance match was a decent enough brawl, which really should have been better. It might have been too, had it not been bogged down with distractions from Kimberly Page, Eric Bischoff, and Canyon. The boot camp match between Booker G.I. Bro T and Sean Stasiak was a snoozer. A standard table match between Shane Douglas and The Wall was turned into a best of five tables match before the bell. And if you're thinking more table bumps meant the match would be better, well, you are bang wrong. Also, even though both men only went through two tables, the franchise somehow ended up the winner. Go figure. The best thing I can say about the United States title Asylum Handicap match with Scott Steiner retaining against Brother Rick and Tank Abbott is, at least it was short. I mean, 3 minutes and 30 seconds of crap is certainly better than 15, you know? Hulk Hogan beat Billy Kidman in a match that was relatively straightforward in comparison to some of the nonsense on this show. It wasn't good, but at least it didn't make me want to commit a crime or anything. And neither did the retirement match between Rick and David Flair, which was automatically fighting an uphill battle due to the presence of Vince Russo. Charlotte's pay-per-view debut here, by the way. The intelligence-insulting human torch match between Sting and Vampiro was one of the worst matches in WCW history. And just think of the ground that covers. And if you're relying on Kevin Nash and Jeff Jarrett to save this steaming pile of sports entertainment excrement, then I have got some unfortunate news to bring you. The match was rotten, and nobody cared because they were all waiting for Goldberg's run-in. What they weren't waiting for was Goldberg to turn heel in one of the most pointless and ill-advised swerves ever. So why did any of this happen? Because screw you, that's why. Number 11, Halloween Havoc. One of the best things I can say about Halloween Havoc 2000 is that it wasn't the Great American Bash. So with those niceties out of the way, let's talk about a show so bad it was downright spooky. Starting the festivities was a three-team match for the WCW tag straps, with the natural-born thrillers Sean O'Hare and Mark Jindrak successfully defending against Mysterio and Kidman and the Boogie Knights. It was all downhill from there, though Reno's hardcore title defense against Sergeant AWOL was fun nonsense. Corporal Cajun and Lieutenant Loco's win over Chuck Palumbo and Sean Stasiak was marginally more exciting than watching paint dry, while the mixed tag between the teams of Shane Douglas and Tori Wilson and Conan and Tigress was saved only by Tori dressing up as Wonder Woman. And before you accuse me of being sexist, I'm not. I'm just really horny, there's a difference. The DNA rules match between Buff Bagwell and David Flair should have been an NDA match, with the gimmick being that nobody would be 
allowed to discuss it afterwards. Although discussing that would have somehow been better than watching the kickboxing match between Mike Sanders and Ernest the Cat Miller, which was poorly booked and horrendously executed. The preceding clunker with Vampiro and that 70s guy Mike Awesome came across like a masterpiece in comparison, and it was still terrible. And so was Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Lance Storm's Canadian title handicap match with General Rection and whatever the hell Jeff Jarrett versus Sting was. I mean, seriously, it's Jeff Jarrett and Sting. Just tell them to go out there and have a good match and they will. Just don't do whatever this was. Booker T's DQ win against Scott Steiner was way below what you would expect from those two and had a customarily frustrating finish, while Goldberg's squash match demolition of Chronic had no business headlining an event people had paid money to see. Number 10, New Blood Rising. It was not so much new blood as my vomit that was rising while watching this Russo-penned nightmare. Finny Roo was back in the big seat as WCW's creative force, a term I use ironically, and sought to push fresh stars. Which is all fine and dandy, of course, but good intentions at a hungry roster will only get you so far if the gimmicks, angles, storylines, and match finishes suck a fat one. This pay-per-view at least began on a positive note, with three count and the young dragons risking life and limb in a wild ladder match. For a gold record, by the way, not a title. The great Mooter and Ernest Miller couldn't hope to follow them, and nor would Buff Bagwell and Canyon. The Four Corners tag team title match had two too many teams and three special guest referees, with Chavo Guerrero putting on a zebra shirt and joining the fun midway through, because why the hell not? Needless to say, it was a total cluster kerfuffle. Shane Douglas and Billy Kidman's strap match should have been better, and it also shouldn't have been a strap match, but here we are. That unnecessary stipulation was followed up with a good old-fashioned rip-off-the-camouflage mud match between Major Guns and Miss Hancock. The winner? Anybody who enjoys a terrible pun. Oh, and perverts too. Sting then buried the demon before Lance Storm retained his US title against Mike Awesome in a Canadian rules match, which was basically a Texas death match with the ref counting a five instead of a three. A second chronic match wasn't something that anyone ordered, let alone Vampiro and a totally uninterested Great Muta. Kevin Nash then beat Scott Steiner and Goldberg in the semi-main, but only after the man had entered after about a minute and then walked out again in an insufferable worked shoot centered around him refusing to take Big Sexy's jackknife powerbomb finisher. Work those marks, bro. Finally, Booker T retained his WCW world title in a mediocre and overbooked match with Jeff Jarrett. Number 9. Sold Out WCW entered the year 2000 in bad shape, with live attendances, television ratings, pay-per-view buy rates, and just about every other metric having tanked in the months leading up to the turn of the millennium. You would think they would put their best foot forward in an effort to turn the tide back, but Sold Out basically showed what kind of year it was going to be for the promotion. Motion. In fact, the very first match did, as Dean Malenko unintentionally got himself disqualified when he bailed out of the ring in a match where the stipulation was that anyone who left the ring would be DQ'd. Doh! The Iceman looked mightily miffed in what turned out to be his final WCW appearance. Vampiro, Crowbar, and David Flair didn't change the tone in their triple threat match. Neither did Big Vito, Johnny the Bull, and the Harris Twins. As for the evening's fourth match, I'll just say this. Oklahoma defeated Medusa to become WCW Cruiserweight Champion. Now let us never speak of it again. The four-man hardcore title match that followed was so bad that it gave credence to the theory WCW WCW were purposely putting on a terrible show. Well, that or they were just physically incapable of producing a single good match. Leave it to Billy Kidman and Perry Saturn to finally get us there. It was under par for what they could do on any other day, but at least it wasn't completely awful. I mean, that's something, isn't it? Booker T and Stevie Ray's Battle of the Brothers brought us back down to Dudsville, however, and Tank Abbott and Jerry Flynn kept us there before DDP and Buff Bagwell brought us back up to mediocre with their last man standing match. Triple Duty Kidman finally tasted defeat at the hands of the wall in a cage match before Kevin Nash powerbombed Terry Funk through three chairs in an entertaining hardcore scrap. 
And in the main event, Chris Benoit beat Sid to capture the vacant WCW world title. A supposed show of goodwill from Booker Kevin Sullivan to the Crippler, it was rendered pointless when Benoit, along with Saturn Malenko and Eddie Guerrero, walked out of the company the very next night. Their loss was very much WWE's gain, and the departure of the so-called Radicals was four more nails in the WCW coffin. Number 8. Uncensored Uncensored was a WCW paper view that typically sucked. And don't you even dare wish that 2000's iteration was going to break with tradition. It began with an uninteresting cruiserweight title match between the artist formerly known as Prince Iakea, it was a joke about pop music icon Prince, don't ask, taking on Psychosis. Once the duel in WCW's crown, the cruiserweight division had deteriorated rapidly by this point, and this outing certainly didn't recapture former glories. It was still better than XS, a repackaged Lenny and Lowe taking on the Screaming Demons, the Kiss Demon and Norman Smiley in face paint, of course. The post-match for Bam Bam Bigelow and the Walls Brawl was more entertaining than the match itself, which should have been a hardcore match or something. Anyway, we wouldn't have to wait long for one of those, with Brian Nobbs winning the hardcore title in a gauntlet match with three count next. Booker, you can no longer call him T because he lost the rights to that, got some revenge on Harlem Heat 2000 by teaming with Kidman to beat them. It didn't completely fall apart plot, which is a miracle considering Stevie Ray and a washed-up Ahmed Johnson were out there. Sadly, Finley couldn't drag anything halfway watchable out of Vampiro in their Fools Count Anywhere contest, and the tag title match between the Mamelukes and Harris brothers was exactly as good as the participants would suggest, i.e. not good at all. A bull rope match between Terry Funk and Dustin Rhodes sounds good on paper, but matches aren't wrestled on paper, and this was a major disappointment, save for the typically zany antics of the Funker. A lumberjack match between IRL besties Sting and Lex Luger was poor, as was the WCW title match between Sid and Jeff Jarrett. That match didn't close the show though, oh no, we've got to reserve that spot for the 873rd meeting between Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair, this time in a Yappa Pie Indian strap match, brother! As redundant as you would imagine, it was made even worse by the nonsensical finish, as WCW seemingly forgot the rules and had the Hulkster prevail by pinfall in a strap match. Number 7. Mayhem Hey gang, ready for more lackluster, if not totally rotten matches and terrible creative? Great, me too. Can't wait. Let's do it. So, Mayhem 2000 then. We check in with a damning indictment of the cruiserweight division's decline, as above-average Mike Sanders battled Kwee for the gold. Shame your matches couldn't even manage average, Mike. Things picked up with some proper cruisers, as Three Count, the Young Dragons, and the duo of Jamie Noble and Evan Courageous put on an entertaining three-team spot fest. And there's only one way to follow a high-flying, all-action match like that. Jimmy Hart versus Man Cow. Yep, seriously, and Man Cow wasn't even some excellent Mantar type creation. It was just a man, a DJ or something. There was nothing cow about him. What a letdown. The three way hardcore title match was nothing we hadn't seen a thousand times by this point and was boring as a result, while Billy Kidman and Rey Mysterio's handicap match victory over Chronic and Alex Wright was nobody's finest hour. The Cat and Shane Douglas stunk up the joint with Bam Bam Bigelow and Sergeant AWOL following. Suits? Wanna make it three for three, Lance Storm and General Rection? Why not, eh? Hey, Buff Bagwell and Jeff Jarrett, why don't you get yourselves over here and make it an even four stinkers in a row? The streak was mercifully broken with the Insiders and the Perfect Event scrapping for the tag team titles. They kept it simple, the fans responded, and it was fine, making it one of the best things on the show to this point. Lex Luger was as up for being squashed by Goldberg as you would predict before we checked out with pay-per-view poster boy Scott Steiner beating Booker T in a straight jacket caged heat match to bag the WCW title. They would have better matches together, but this was about as good as you would expect from a WCW main event in this era. Number 6. Super Brawl As per usual, WCW sent out the cruiserweights to warm the crowd up at Super Brawl 2000, with Lash LaRue and the artist formerly known as Prince Iakea competing in the tournament final for the vacant cruiserweight strap. It was just sort of there. So too was Brian Nob 
Hobbs and Bam Bam Bigelow's hardcore title match. Like much of what WCW were attempting in this era, it was a pale imitation of stuff WWE were doing far better on the other channel. Another short and uninspired match came next in the form of Norman Smiley's handicap loss to three count. The theme continued with the Demon vs. The Wall and Tank Abbott taking on Big Al in a leather jacket on a pole match. I cannot for one second believe Vince Russo wasn't booking at this point, especially when the next match revolved around the rights to the letter T. However, this one is actually on Kevin Sullivan. Shame on you. The show finally perked up seven whole friggin' matches in, with Kidman and Vampiro managing to wake the crowd up with an action-packed, albeit slightly sloppy, bout. Unfortunately, the Sicilian stretcher match for the tag titles couldn't keep the momentum going. Despite having some fun moments, it was a bit of a mess overall. James Brown then showed up for a segment with Ernest Miller. I mean, sure, why not? Ric Flair and Terry Funk's Texas Deathmatch would have doubtless been better had it been 1989, but it was still fun to see the old old boys out there doing their thing. Speaking of old boys doing their thing, Hulk Hogan's win over Lex Luger was basically a red and yellow greatest hits tape in what was Hogan's second match back following his post-Halloween Havoc vacation. And while we're on the subject of phoning it in, the three-way WCW world title main events really should have been better considering the players involved. Scott Hall's last WCW match was not exactly one to savour. Number 5. Bash at the Beach How apropos that Hulk Hulk Hogan made his in-ring WCW debut at the very first Bash at the Beach pay-per-view in 1994 and had his swan song at the very last. Not that the Hulkster envisioned that being the case or anything. Bash at the Beach 2000, which as far as WCW's efforts in 2000 are concerned wasn't completely without merit, was overshadowed by the farcical situation involving Hogan, Vince Russo and Jeff Jarrett. There are multiple accounts of what actually went down. Was it a work? Was it a shoot? Was it Brony marks without a life, not realizing it was a work, then working a work and working themselves into a shoot. But the end result was Terry Bollea leaving the promotion and subsequently suing Russo and then AOL Time Warner. The show began well enough, with Juventu Guerrero and Lieutenant Loco having a perfectly respectable cruiserweight title match. The highlights of the hardcore title affair was Ralphus, remember him, being about a mile away from the action and yet somehow managed to fall over and cut his head open. The wedding gown, quote unquote, match between Daphne and Miss Hancock, meanwhile, was Gee, would you look at that, I appear to have run out of words, or at least words YouTube will allow me to say. Chronic's tag title victory against the perfect event was surprisingly good, despite some predictable sloppiness. Booker T's match with Positively Canyon was also good, but then it should have been, shouldn't it? As was Mike Awesome's DQ win against US champion Scott Steiner. They were having a heck of a wild brawl before the week finish. And you know what Vampiro's graveyard match with the Demon was? A pleasant surprise, shockingly entertaining, better than it had any right to be? No, it was dumb. It was dumb and stupid and stupidly dumb, and I hated it. Shane Douglas then beat Buff Bagwell in a match that happened before the Hogan Jarrett Russo farce threatened to bring the show to a screeching halt. Goldberg defeated Kevin Nash in the semi main, terminating Scott Hall's contract as per the pre match stips. Nice to get that sorted out months after the bad guy had actually left the company, eh? And in the impromptu main event, Booker T beat Jeff Jarrett to win the first of his five WCW titles. It was actually a really good match, all things considered, but the feel-good moment didn't fully wash the sour taste out of the mouth after the political nonsense from earlier. Number 4. Spring Stampede Fun fact, only one match at Spring Stampede 2000 broke the 10-minute barrier. In saying that, there were 14 of them on the card, so, you know, perhaps brevity was a good thing here. Six days before the pay-per-view, Russo and Bischoff returned to WCW to spearhead a company-wide reboot, which included stripping all reigning champions of their titles. As a result, most of the matches at Spring Stampede were either tournament matches or matches to determine champions. Though Russo vowed to lead the new blood against the Millionaires Club of aging headliners, it was Flair and Luger going over the Mamelukes and Harris twins in the show's handicap match opener. And then that promising up-and-comer Mancow beat Jimmy Hart. Yes, WCW booked this match twice on paper. Per view within a six-month period. It's really hard to figure out why they went out of business, isn't it?
Scott Steiner beat the wall in a short but suitably violent match before Mike Awesome went over Ernest Miller in a shockingly good bout. Both matches were quarterfinals in the US title tournament. Shane Douglas and Buff Bagwell's tag title tournament semi-final victory over Harlem Heat 2000 was nothing to write home about since it wasn't given enough time to fully suck. The US title tournament continued with Sting beating Booger You Still Can't Call Him T in a solid outing with Vampiro beating Kidman in another good match between those two. Two. Terry Funk then won the hardcore title by beating Norman Smiley in a really fun off the wall contest. Steiner booked his place in the US title tournament final by beating Awesome in a match that was just getting going before it finished. He would meet Sting, who blew past Vampiro in the other semi final. A six man cruiserweight title match was a fun scramble, but didn't have enough time to hit that next level before Chris Candido walked away with the belt. The franchise and the stuff then beat Flair and Luger thanks to interference from a debut in Chronic. The genetic freak upended the icon to walk away with the US title. Match was kinda meh and featured yet more outside interference and blood. And in the main event, the chosen one Jeff Jarrett won his first WCW heavyweight title by besting DDP in a tournament final. Now let's all slap our nuts in celebration. Number 3. Slamboree For a long time, these four words were enough to crush the spirit of any self-respecting professional wrestling fan. Ready? World Champion David Arquette And while the Hollywood actor was inexplicably defending the title in the headliner of Slamboree 2000, the show itself really wasn't all bad. I mean, it wasn't good or anything, but this is WCW in 2000, so we're kind of grading on a sliding scale here. It started with Chris Candido retaining his crew weight title against the artist in a solid enough match. Terry Funk's hardcore title defense over Norman Smiley, who was accompanied by the clueless Ralphus, was demented fun. Sean Stasiak and Kurt Hennig had a lame storyline to work with going into their match, but the bout itself was perfectly acceptable wrestling. Prior to his US title match with Scott Steiner, Hugh Morris announced that he would no longer be known by that silly pun of a moniker, but going forward would be referred to as Hugh G. Rection. And for those not so quick on the uptake, that's huge erection. <laughs> Get it? The surprisingly good match was appropriately stiff, because once again, huge erection, with Freakzilla retaining. A lame ending wasn't enough to sully the good work put forth by Mike Awesome and Canyon, two talents who consistently tried to swim against the tide of crap in latter day WCW and could always be counted on to put in a shift. The same can't be said for Lex Luger and Buff Bagwell, mind you. Their match here was mostly posing and rest. Holds. Five stars for the buys and tries and abs, I must say. Shane Douglas and Ric Flair's noted real-life animosity played into their match and gave it a nice level of intensity. A terrible finish, as you might expect, but they had their working boots on before it. Sting's win over Vampiro was short, but fun while it lasted. Once you get over how surreal it is to see Billy Kidman take on Hulk Hogan in a freaking pay-per-view, the match itself is shockingly entertaining. So too was the spectacle that was the main event, a triple cage match like the one seen in WCW-backed movie Ready to Rumble. With Arquette mainly staying out of the way, Jeff Jarrett and DDP did the vast majority of the work before Swerve Arquette turned on Dallas to hand Double J the title. Number 2. Fall Brawl Like Slamboree, Fall Brawl featured nothing that was necessarily must-see, but it wasn't completely awful and thus was one of WCW's best pay-per-views of the year. No prizes for guessing, the Cruiserweights kicked things off, and while it wasn't exactly Ultimo Dragon vs Dean Malenko or anything, the title bout between Elix Skipper and Kiwi was characteristically energetic. The Misfits in action then beat Three Count in a real hidden gem of a match. Seriously, this was a lot of fun and I have nothing Nothing snarky to say about it. The Harris brothers got one over on Chronic in what was originally billed as a chain match, but soon became a first blood chain match because if Vince Russo has taught us anything, it's that there's no such thing as too many gimmicks. Lance Storm's Canadian title defense against General Rection was as good as its place on the card would suggest, and who doesn't love a good Jim Duggan heel turn? Up next, the Filthy Animals and the Natural Born Thrillers went to a no contest in an enthralling 7 vs 7 affair. It's just 
a shame the match had to be stopped after honorary animal Paul Mr. Filthy Orndorff got injured. The mixed tag scaffold match between Shane Douglas and Tori Wilson and Billy Kidman and Medusa was as awful as it sounds, as was the triple threat with Vampiro, Muta and Sting. The show got back on track thanks to the bunkhouse brawl between Jeff Jarrett and Mike Awesome before Scott Steiner and Goldberg had a hard-hitting big man match. A bit too much interference and other shenanigans for my liking, but the effort was there and the big bad booty daddy got a big W via technical submission. And in the alleged main event, Booker T regained the WCW world title by beating Kevin Nash in a cage match. Two positives here, Nash lost clean and his hair looked immaculate throughout. That's the power of a premium conditioner for you. Number 1. Starcade. Saving the best for last, WCW puts on a very entertaining Starcade in what turned out to be the final version of an event that had been the company's answer to WrestleMania. It wasn't close to WrestleMania caliber, of course, but it was the best we had seen from WCW in a very long time. The pace was set in the three-team ladder match opener. Again, it's not like the Young Dragons 3 Count Evan Courageous and Jamie Noble were on the same level as the Hardys, Dudleys and Edge and Christian, but they busted their cute little butts out there and should be proud of their efforts. Now, if I can be serious for a minute, Lance Storm also deserves a lot of credit because I'm fairly certain he's the reason his match with Ernest Miller was as smooth as it was. Terry Funk regained the hardcore title in a nutty and very enjoyable match with Crowbar, another performer from the dying days of WCW who always seemed to give it a proper go. The quality dipped a little with Chronic's no contest with Big Vito and Reno, followed up by an uninspired ambulance match between Mike Awesome and Bam Bam Bigelow. The crowd didn't really care about General Rection's lethargic US title defense against Shane Douglas, and can you really blame them? The bunkhouse street fight between the filthy animals Jeff Jarrett and the Harris brothers didn't make any sense, then again this was WCW in 2000 and nothing made sense, but the action sure was worth watching for spots like Mysterio getting powerbombed from the ring into a dumpster on the outside. The insiders won the tag straps from the perfect event in a match that was super over with the live crowd. Despite the match itself being basic formula here, the reactions greatly enhanced it and made it much better than it ought to have been. Goldberg and Lex Luger also tried in their no-holds-barred match with Demand's career on the line. Couldn't overcome the suck though, could they? Two men who could overcome the expected suck were Scott Steiner and Sid Vicious, who closed out the show and WCW's year on pay-per-view with a shockingly gripping world title match. There were no classic and still plenty of stuff that made the eyes roll, but Starcade 2000 was good value, if not too little too late as far as the promotion was concerned. 